let me ask you all a question. Can songs be written ahead of their time? Yes. Certainly, yes, they can. Now, when we listen to a song, no matter when it was written, usually it provides a bit of a window into that time, that place, the emotions that the singer, the songwriter was experiencing at the time. It can also give us insight into the times themselves, the social and political, economic situation that the song was written in. A lot of times, maybe overtly or covertly, they're even commenting on them. I know we see that a lot over the years. But um, it's a capsule into the mind and the heart of the artist, as well as its listener, because when we listen to music, it's sometimes with certain songs that resonate with us, it's hard to keep that objective distance from what we're listening to. It reminds us of things, it resonates happily or maybe even sadly with you know, what we've dealt with in that time or even in the present. So um, my next question for you is, can songwriters predict the future? What do you think? Show of hands, yes? think they have that ability? It's possible, yeah. So over the years, there's a song I've heard kind of in passing by Irving Berlin. It's called What'll I Do? It's an old standard. It was actually written in 1923. And in 1923, there was no social media. There was no internet. There was online dating. What the heck was that? So I mean, these are things that have come <laughs> far down the road. But um, the more I've listened to the song, I've realized that it does in a way, really signal what people who have been through online dating or what we call mass personal communication have experienced. And I'm going to go through these topics piece by piece, but I just wanted to kind of preface with Irving Berlin's song titled What Will I Do, I feel really illustrates online dating and the experience of being in a mediated relationship. Okay, so Irving Berlin had in the 19, early 1920s, he had a... Uh, a lover, I guess we'll say. I forget if they were married or not, but uh, she lived thousands of miles away. There was a long geographic distance between the two of them, and it was obviously very hard for Irving because, you know, he missed her. So he started to write a lot of songs in the early 20s about longing and yearning for this person, and to yearn is to a desire to love others and be loved back. That's Eric Booth's definition in a book called The Everyday Work of Art, which is a wonderful book, highly recommend it. Okay, so... In writing What Will I Do, he is really speaking to missing his love, his beloved, I guess we'll say. And this song has been used in movies, in television. It's been covered by a number of artists over the years, including Judy Garland, for example. So what I liked about this song was that it's concerned with genuine emotion, missing someone. What will I do in your absence? What will I do without you? I mean, these are still questions we ask when we're, you know, distant from someone that we miss, someone that we cherish. And um, I know nowadays a lot of interaction is done over technology, texting, social media, you name it. But I have to say, despite that technological bubble that we live in, and I say we because we all do to some extent, we still embrace those emotions because I think that genuine feelings of love and commitment and attachment, I mean, they are still present, and obviously I'm not going to get into the technical aspects of it because that's kind of outside of what I'm saying here, but the tech bubble that I've mentioned does add relevance to the song because, as I, I, I threw the term out a minute ago, mass personal communication. We have interpersonal communication, which is interaction among people, but now with social media and texting and even FaceTime and being able to Skype and do things, the technology piece comes into it, there is still an interpersonal dialogue, but now since the channel is obviously technological, bringing about what's called mass personal communication. So I use the example for this paper talking about online dating specifically, because if I were to get into all the different modes of mass personal communication, we'd be here all day. So online dating, now some are lucky and they leave cyberspace eventually and they go to that Starbucks on the corner or the bistro down the street. But many don't. Unfortunately, many do not. Now, I'm not going to say that Irving Berlin predict, or predicted the internet or predicted social media. I'm not going to even try to make that claim because I don't believe it. But his lyrics do provide a very striking, I guess you can say, alignment to this whole situation, as I had mentioned a little earlier, and the emotions that people who are engaged in online dating, and I say engaged, I mean involved, not engaged they are involved with. So I'd like to go through the song line by line, and as I say, my, my singing does not measure up to Marlene's, but um, just bear with me. It is also a little early in the morning. So um, what'll I do if you have gone away 
and I am blue. What'll I do? Now, we talk about social media, we talk about these platforms, OkCupid, Match.com, you name it. They very much function like a swinging door. People log in and they log out, not necessarily in any kind of pattern. There could be, you know, five minutes between logins. There could be five weeks or five months. Okay, also, people, when they get tired of talking to someone or being contacted by someone, they can hit block very easily. They can also delete their accounts at moment's notice. And typically, unless they've established some type of respect or rapport with someone, they won't say, oh, I'm going to be taking a break from this site. Have a great life. Best of luck to you. Off they go. So there's really no obligation to announce one's coming or going or their departure. Now, a lot of what people will also just stop using the site. Maybe they don't have the time. Maybe they're finding that online dating just isn't as fulfilling as a face-to-face -face encounter with someone. So, but do other people know that? Not necessarily. We just see logged in today, logged in a week ago, logged in, logged in a month ago, and people will then form their own interpretations on that. Now, Suzanne Langer, in her book, Philosophy in a New Key, she says that words are our most important instruments of expression. And when you're using an online dating platform, okay, Cupid, Match.com, et cetera, communication is done through words. You're typing, you're responding, just like how email functions. There's no paralanguage, there's no nonverbals, you can't see facial expressions, you can't differentiate between tone of voice to see if the person's really interested in what you're saying or if they're just sort of obligatory responding to what you're saying. You can sometimes interpret the rapidity of the logins. You know, did they log in yesterday, today, blah, 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 as well as the duration between replies. If they responded very quickly. They want to talk to me. They're interested in what I have to say. They're eager to share things about themselves. But if an hour and a half goes by, maybe they're not interested. It could have nothing to do with you. It's just that's sometimes how we interpret that. Those periods of absence become almost like the para language, even though they are not, but they function in a similar capacity. And um, an area of interest to me is also color psychology. I'm sure you've dealt with that to some degree as well. So it's interesting that Berlin mentions blue, and you know, to feel blue is obviously an expression referring to sadness, but blue is said to represent sadness, but also a depth of knowledge. So looking at perhaps the sharing and the development of a relationship, even though it is predominantly through words. And I think a little funny thing I should point out, looking at these different platforms, a lot of them have the color blue in their logos. Unfortunately, I don't have anything to project with me today. But I just find that a very interesting colored choice in OkCupid. And uh, Plenty of Fish, for example, they use co the blue color in their logo. So are they talking about depth and richness of information, or are they talking about feeling sad because it didn't work out? Who knows? OK, moving right along. What'll I do when I am wondering who is kissing you? What'll I do? See, now I'm looking up. I'm kind of adjusting. OK, I can, I can sing in front of these people. <laughs> All right. <laughs> this is a first for me. OK, so wondering what? Oh, thank you. OK, so but look, what, when I'm wondering, OK, so there's a comparison being made. So questioning one's loyalty. Also, thinking about another, but you don't know who the other is. Are they more attractive than I am? Are they smarter? Do they just look as if they live a more exciting, fascinating life? And in some cases, people may feel compelled to make a case for themselves. You know, I can, I can treat you well. I can do nice things. I'm interested. I'm concerned. You know, people start kind of building that case and that sense of, yes, you should give me the time of day. So people will start to do that based upon an assumption, maybe even a paranoia in some sense, because they really don't know who else the other person is talking to. They don't see their inbox. They don't see, it's not like Facebook where you can see the person's friends with and what they look like and what they're doing. Okay, so when people are engaged in online dating, they tend to present the best of themselves. They post a photograph. It's the nicest picture of them, dressed very nice, in a nice environment, maybe lit well. And of course, you get the people that you know they need the angle and the lighting to be just right. Also, maybe doing something exciting. They're at some fancy event, or they're you know, jumping out of an airplane, skydiving, whatever they're doing, but they're trying to show the best of themselves to make themselves look more appealing. So that factor comes in with the 
wondering who is kissing you, well, what are they doing that's so amazing? Okay? Moving right along. What'll I do with just a photograph to tell my troubles to? Now we get into a whole nother area, which is photography, the analysis of the visual. Okay, so from the mythic cave paintings to the camera obscura all the way up to the famous selfie. Yeah. <laughs> we, we study visuals, and visuals have a lot, they have a lot that can be said about them. And obviously in online dating, that is especially true because you're not even, you're not necessarily appraising the visual as an art form for its artistic merits. You're thinking, is this someone I want to take out to dinner? Is this someone I want to introduce to my friends? So on and so forth, okay? So... There's a book by Susan Sontag that was written in 1977 called On Photography, and I find that a very fascinating book. And one of the points she makes fairly early on is that photography provides you with an ethics of seeing. So that's determining how things should be photographed, what should and should not be photographed, and so forth. And like I said a minute ago, users will often share their best self, dress nicely, doing something exciting, appealing, maybe even daring, risky, what have you, something that other people may want to go, oh, click. And then they start reading the profile, or maybe they don't start reading the profile, maybe the picture's enough. Because I, I hate to say this, and they come as a shock, some people go to these sites with a little bit more lustful intentions than others. <laughs> I know, fascinating, isn't it? So, but people will be very careful and very strategic about how, what photographs and what they share about themselves, even in writing. When they write their profile, things that are important to them, things they find funny, you know, choice in food, choice in music, so on and so forth. Another variable, particularly relating to photograph, is the quality of the image. Smartphones and obviously DSLR cameras, you can get a pretty nice photograph out of them. The resolution is pretty nice. You also have a lot of control in terms of exposure and you can crop it and do things like that. And then you come across a photograph that has maybe a really low, uh, maybe megapixel level or something like that, maybe it's just very dark, very grainy. Sometimes that's even used in the appraisal of the individual, even if it's not necessarily speaking. They could be a wonderfully, wonderful person, they could be very tech savvy, maybe that's just not the best picture of them. So unfortunately the photograph is also used as a means of appraising the person's character and I guess you can say, is this person really worth my time in getting to know, rightly or wrongly. Photography is the gateway to getting to know someone because when you're looking at a, you know, a list of profiles and you see the, all the thumbnails of people's pictures and you're scrolling and scrolling and you see someone who has that smile or maybe that outfit or they're in just a nice place, click because you see the picture before you read the profile. So the, photo the photography, the photograph, particularly the profile shot, serves as the gateway into getting to know the person. Okay, and a lot of times, entire impressions of a person are crafted based on a photograph, and I emphasize a because you could go into the profile and then see 10 other pictures, but it's that first one that almost functions as the sales pitch, so to speak. You know, they're, they're photographed just in the right way, They've, like I say, the right smile, the right posture, the right setting, so on and so forth. And, bec and with the photographs, and this is kind of taking you a little bit farther, that establishes a false sense of presence. You're looking at a picture, but remember, your person really isn't there. They're not really listening to you. And sometimes, I guess you can say, our, our desires and our hopes kind of start to cloud that distance that's really there because there's no face-to-face. -face. There's really no proximal distance, even if the picture gives you that sense that there is or maybe at least feeds to your desire that there is. Okay? Moving right along, and this is the last of my singing, I promise. When I'm alone with only dreams of you that won't come true, what'll I do? So, talking about being alone. Online dating is largely intrapersonal, not to be confused with interpersonal, intrapersonal. It's largely going on alone and in the sense of solitude. You know, you're sitting in front of your computer or you're using your phone, but it is not interpersonal, as I said, mass personal and interpersonal are obviously quite different in this context. So 
Babro uh, proposed a concept called problematic integration, and he has three components to that, and I'm going to just kind of go through these real quick as they relate. The first one is uncertainty, which is how do you feel toward me? Ultimately, that's what you're trying to gauge by the person's responses, how fast or how slow they're responding. Do they respond at all? What do they share with you? So the looking at the quality of the feedback as well as the rate of the feedback. Also, ambi eh, excuse me, ambivalence or lack thereof, which kind of follows the same thought, and impossible desires. I found that one particularly interesting. Impossible desire perhaps being I want to be with you, I want to get to know you, but if the other person doesn't feel the same way, it's not going to happen. And if you try to push the issue or make a case for yourself, the person could just go block or stop responding altogether. So you lose that scent, that opportunity as you'd have in a face-to-face -face situation. If you're you know, sitting at Starbucks over a cup of coffee and talking, there's definitely a lot more uh, opportunity to build that case, whereas online, you, you don't get it. Okay, and um, looking at the fact that they're not replying or they're not logging in, a lot of people will then interpret that as a personal slight. And as I said earlier, it isn't always a personal slight. It could just be the other person doesn't have the time, or maybe they just don't find it as fulfilling. They'd rather talk to someone. They realize that after a while. So kind of taking that and internalizing, it kind of brings a sense of narcissism into the whole thing, because what am I doing wrong? And look at the, look at the line. Look at the title of the song. What'll I do? Little bit self-centered, much? Okay, now um, I'm kind of new in terms of bringing this into general semantics. This is, as I said earlier, an area that's kind of new to me and I'm interested in how this kind of plays in. But um, the area that I've noticed kind of right away was the concept of maps versus territories. And um, the map in this case would be what users think they found. They think they found a suitable companion. They think they found someone they're gonna get along really well with. But the territory is what they, they really are or aren't developing because they often think that they're making a good rapport they're presenting themselves in a way that's appealing to other people but maybe they're not okay so perception in this case is clouded by desire this is what i want and i'm using a lot of personal pronouns here because as i said that's what this song i hate to say it has a bit of a narcissistic tone to it so that lack of feedback what happens the person doesn't respond we fill in the blanks they found someone else they're not interested they they went back with their ex, whatever happened, okay? May not be true, but that's how we interpret it because there's nothing there for interpretation. Am I coming down to the end? Okay. So to get, to kind of wrap this up, I'm gonna mention, you know, crazy talk, stupid talk is the theme of today of the conference. And I think the crazy talk here and stupid talk is the fact that how rational are these interpretations when you're in an online dating situation you really don't, you, you don't have enough feedback to really make a sound interpretation or rational interpretation. I think a lot of what we think does qualify as crazy talk and in many cases stupid talk. And if you look at some of the responses people type, it can probably fall under both. So the song, What'll I Do, talks about a lot of genuine emotion, love and longing and desire. And even in this technologically frenzied world we live in, it all is still very present. And it's only increased in relevance with online media. The song was written in 1923. There was no online media or and there was no internet, period. It's it was always interesting to me over listen uh, listening to this song over the years, how relevant it's become. So I'll leave you with this. If you were alone and only had a photograph, dreams, and hopes for what could be, what would you do? Thank you.